All right. Well, welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin. I'm a executive editor. I can't remember what my title is in a given time. With the Mises Institute. And with me, of course, as always, is my co-host, Tho Bishop. And this is a special live edition of Radio Rothbard. We're doing it here at Mises University in July 2023. And so Tho and I are just going to uh, talk today. We had to come up with some topic that uh, would seem like a good fit for the event. And we're going to talk at some length, we have only 45 minutes, so we have to make sure it actually finish on time. We can't just edit it down, I suppose. Uh, we're going to talk about anatomy of the state in uh, some detail, which is one of, I think, Rothbard's most enduring uh, essays and probably the best introductory essay on really the core of what Rothbard was thinking as a political theorist, as opposed to his economic theory. Um, and so certainly I would recommend this essay. If you can pick up a little booklet, you might enjoy that. And it's not very long, uh, but it's, I just find it to be an excellent summary of really what is the state, how does it function, what's some of the scholarship behind it, some of the ideas. Uh, and uh, you have some information about where this essay comes from and what its origins are. Yeah, because when we're looking at doing this episode, obviously I've loved the, the article for a very long time. I read it, you know, usually about once a year. And I was like, well, where exactly did this come from? And you look at it, there's not really a mention. Then, I, you know, it, it has a, it was except, uh, accepted from Egalitarianism as a Revolt Against Nature and other essays, uh, which was published in the 1970s as a collection. It was actually originally written for Rampart Journal in 1965. And so I think that makes it all the more impressive is that this is something relatively early in his career. This is before a lot of his other political works. It's also within a three-year span where you have America's Great Depression. You have what has government done to our money. Um, you've got other great articles on war and the state. And this comes out, and it's just incredible you know, what, what can be published within just that short time span. Ray Rothbard being very unique. That's why he gets his own. That's why we named the podcast after him. Um, that's also why we make mugs based off the podcast, get yours outside. Um, but yeah, it, it really is such a, a fascinating article. And it's one that, that it seems to, to continue with relevance. I mean, you, when you have Jack Dorsey, which okay, fine, checkered past there a little bit. Um, but you know, you have people that are obviously discovering some of these ideas in very established areas and get excited about what they get from this Rothbardian analysis of the state. And I, I think that, you know, while there might be debates over, you know, libertarian ethics like we had earlier, there, there can be debates about other things. You know, what, what people are really waking up to right now is the extent to which the state does not them. You know, we are not the state. And the more the, the facade of legitimacy breaks down, particularly within the U.S. right now, I think more and more people can find something within Rothbard's work that can, they can resonate with, and that's why uh, we're going to Well, I think that just takes us right into the first section of this essay, which is titled, What the State is Not. And he starts right in with that, is that the state is not us. It's not we. Uh, it's not an extended family. It's not an organism that we're all a part of and have some sort of special bond to everyone else within uh, the territory that the state controls. And this really is an enduring idea that I think until you start to get people thinking beyond that mode of thinking, that you don't have much help uh, or much hope in getting people to really start to be suspicious of the regime that uh, they live under. Because you can just see it all the time in talking to people, right? They, they use the we thing when they talk about what, whatever the government is doing. Oh, we have to fight Russia as if you have like a bomber in your garage or something and <laughs> you're part of the effort. Uh, we doesn't describe it at all. There's a regime that uh, takes your money and spends it on certain things and they have certain interests that are not your interests and they do stuff with it. And the state has been very effective, though, at convincing people into thinking that the interests of the regime coincide with your interests. And I think that's that's where Rothbard starts out um, pointing out 
what the state is not. And that's just the number one thing that you have to embrace and where I think we also continue to get some of the most resistance from conservatives and other people who uh, don't like liberalism, free market liberalism, classical liberalism, and they, they are really hung up on this idea of creating this idea of an organic community. Uh, that the state oversees and the state needs to protect our culture, needs to, to make us feel more unified to random people you'll never meet thousands of miles away and create this uh, artificial construct that they think is super important. They're really just prisoners of modern ideas of nationalism uh, and other aspects of ideology that didn't exist more than 400 years ago. Uh, but good luck getting these people to abandon those ideas. We have to. We have a lot of work left to do with that. And so I think it's it's significant that Rothbard puts that at the beginning of the essay. Because I, I don't know many people right now that would want uh, Joe Biden to be their daddy, though there is. Apparently, it comes with great legal immunity. So you know there there might be if you can get that family deal there. Um, but you know the the, the facade, the the, uh, the the respect that people have within the leader, the head of state. Right. It's not simply a Biden phenomenon, but a tree. You know, we can go back. Trump. I mean, Obama was was a very polarizing guy, though. You know, perhaps a little bit more charismatic. You know, just a little more polished at the edges there. Bush, right? You know, the the you're not you're not seeing a lot of people with uh, portraits of the president in their living room that uh, you, you might have had in, in a different sort of of day and age where there was some sort of uh, reverence for you know a, a John F. Kennedy. You know, I respect even for, you know, a, a Nixon in some circles. Um, you know, that's that the idea of, of the great father figure as the president of the United States, I think, is, is dying, which is a good thing. Yeah. Thank goodness people don't do that anymore. I mean, none of the, I mean, in those days, too, it's always good to not fall for the whole oh, good old days argument that, oh, presidents were higher quality 50 years ago or something like that. And imagine being a parent and teaching your children to look up to a U.S. president as like a role model of some kind. I mean, that is, that's just embarrassing. But some people teach their children these sorts of things. And always a U.S. senator, he must be, you know, someone to look up to. He's very successful. I mean, I, I don't know if that's still a thing, but we know in the past that the, the emotional attachment, not just to the regime, but the people who work for it was very strong. Well, look, look at John Fetterman up there. Even you can become a U.S. senator. <laughs> well, let's go into what, uh, what is the definition of the state? And Rothbard gives that. Um, he uses just the Weberian definition, the Max Weber definition of the state. Now, Weber was a sociologist from the late 19th uh, century, and Mises quotes him. Um, Mises liked some of Weber's stuff, and Weber had some liberal elements to his thought, but I wouldn't call him one. And uh, he notes... And variations, you'll find variations on this definition, but it's pretty much what most people use now, is that the state is an organization with a monopoly on the means of coercion within a specific territory. And this is, or some variation of this is the definition that Rothbard gives in here. So he's not departing from that standard definition, and he finds that to be useful, and he uses it. And the elements, then, of that definition are very important then, right? The state is an organization. It's a corporation of sorts uh, that is separate from you and you're not an owner of it. And it has a monopoly. That's a very important aspect. And it's territorial. It's, uh, it oversees a particular territory. And so all of those elements then combine, I think, to provide some elements of, uh, well, they just help inform us as to what the state is, why it's separate from you. And why it's different. But he notes that this organization, what characterizes this organization is that it provides, quote, I'm quoting him, provides a legal orderly systematic channel for the predation of private property. And so the state, which maybe had its origins in sloppier ideas of piracy, right? Like St. Augustine notes that uh, a prince uh, is fundamentally indistinguishable from just a pirate in terms of he steals stuff and then he spends it on what, what he wants. Now, of course, some princes are better than others, uh, just like some pirates are better than others. Uh, but that element there is, is very important in that, yeah, it starts out 
as, oh, we just steal stuff as we need it, and then we come back when we steal some more. Whereas the state provides a system of, well, we're going to come and steal from you on the first of the month, every month, and we're only going to steal 5%, and so this will enable you, it'll give you some regularity where you can continue to run your business and plan your household budget and that sort of thing. And so it just becomes this relationship of, hey, we don't function like common thieves. We steal a set amount every month uh, from you, and so it's a different situation. And so setting up all of these legal institutions allow the state to do this. And in a sense, it does then allow for economic growth and for predictability. And you can see how that benefits both the state then and uh, if you are a, a helpless peasant, you can at least then know what to expect in some cases. So uh, you can see how maybe there was some back and forth there and how this organization came to be over time, but he notes always that this is a predatory relationship and not one of like a family member, uh, right, helping you uh, be a steward of your own goods for your own, uh, for your own benefit or something like that. That's not the sort of relationship at all. Of course, earlier this week, we saw uh, several lectures by uh, uh, Dr. Tate Fegley that looked at, you know, the, the bureaucratic aspects that come within this predatory relationship, you know, the, the, the need for resources outside of economic calculation and voluntary interaction, um, the way that that plays into fueling the deep state and police and things like this. And um, so again, it's, it's, it's understanding this, this fundamental aspect of, of why voluntary action is just, is, is makes everything better. Um, this is a good, good, good foundation here. And I think I would want to emphasize also that this essay is a good introduction to the scholarship of the state. I, I'm sure Rothbard did not consider it the final word on the topic, and I think it provides a lot, a good starting point for doing some additional reading and and how to think conceptually about how the state functions. And I would note just one area of. Uh, for example, disagreement in our own circles is Rothbard quotes in the essay Franz Oppenheimer a lot. Uh, now, Oppenheimer had an essay called The State, and Oppenheimer made an important uh, observation where he noted that uh, the state is the political means of obtaining property. And so you can have market means where you trade and you build things and you homestead and all that, and then there's the political means where you steal it. And he looks at the origins of the state then as a matter of conquest of sorts, of where you had one group of people and they went out and they found another group of people like that pirate victim relationship, and then they just steal from those people. Now, it is debatable. There is, it's fairly controversial as to what, how did the state in real life in the historical world actually arise? So it's, there is not agreement on that. And so I could note, even within our group, um, there's a great essay by Carlo Lottieri. Uh, it's the first essay in a book out there called The Myth of National Defense uh, in the bookstore, edited by Hoppe. But uh, Lottieri's is the first essay, and he's got an essay in there called the, the Problem of Security. And he looks at how did the state actually arise. And some of the key issues are come from the fact that there is a division of labor problem. So not everybody was skilled at protecting themselves. Um, and so if you had a group of people nearby who were skilled warriors, essentially the warrior class, you could employ them uh, to provide protection from a nearby group that was perhaps more troublesome. And there was actually a back and forth then, according to Lottieri, where you did have essentially arise a, a market relationship between, say, the peasants and the herdsmen. The herdsmen were more skilled at uh, providing defense, and you would pay them or uh, more likely barter with them and invite them to provide this security purpose. But at the, that over time, that relationship formed into something more exploitative. And that that is an alternative idea of uh, how the state arose, that it wasn't just strictly a conquest sort of uh, situation. And we can note that then in a lot of the scholarship that arises. And there's a lot of different stuff you can read on this. Uh, certainly, I quote in my stuff a lot, Martin Van Creveld's Rise and Decline of the State. I'm not sure that he presents like a 
theory uh, of how the state always forms or anything like that, but he does provide countless uh, historical examples of how it works. And so I would certainly encourage people to use this as a, just a starting off point and to start identifying some of the debates over where the state comes from and uh, how it forms. And there are some great uh, Mises U lectures by uh, Ryan on this very topic that I highly recommend looking back on. Yeah, well, uh, I think one of our most popular videos ever is uh, we are in the middle of a long war with the state that I did here at Mises U a couple of years ago. So we do look, I use Lotieri a bit in that and we go into some detail. Uh, so check that out if you have, uh, it's only half an hour, so if you have 30 minutes. Uh, so the next section is how does the state preserve itself? And this one seems to be especially timely, I think, nowadays, because he's got stuff in here on the importance of propaganda for the regime uh, because he recognizes, uh, as say like uh, Etienne de la Boete would note in uh, his work, which is significant as well, that if people just generally hated the state for the most part, if the majority just didn't want to do what the regime told them to do, the regime would not be able to rule. It would be they, they don't have enough resources. They just can't force people unless people submit at least tacitly to the rule of the regime. So how do you ensure that people do that? Well, very important that you propagandize them and convince them that they're part of the, the regime and it's, it looks out for their interests and we're all a big family and all of those problems that Rothbard points out at the beginning. And so it can't be just through force of arms. It has to be by getting people to think it's okay and this, of course, can be done through um, schooling uh, and also through media. But all of that requires, as Rothbard notes in this essay, is that it relies heavily on essentially an intellectual class of people who ensure that people think uh, in terms of how the state wants you to think. Now, in many, many centuries past, and of course, in the East, in the Near East, the Far East, you always had essentially a, a priestly class of some kind that would serve as the educated people and the clerics and uh, tell people uh, how to think and, and what to believe. And this was especially notable farther east. In the West, you had the problem where the church didn't actually agree with the civil authorities a lot of times, so they hated each other and actually encouraged the people to ally against one side or the other, whereas farther east you had a situation where the rulers were said to be gods or where uh, they claimed to be just direct representatives of the divine. And so they used that as a means of controlling the population. But Rothbard notes that now we've abandoned that and now we have scientists who tell everybody how to think. And uh, that, just reading that in light of the whole COVID freak out and how, well, if you believe in science, you believe the regime. And if you don't, you're anti-science. And apparently in 1965, that was already a thing that uh, was clear. And to be sure, I notice um, he does quote uh, Bertrand de Juvenal, who has a bunch of good thinking about science uh, as well, and how uh, the scientist class is used to propagandize the people. And so that, I think, is one of the most prescient sections of the essay right now. It, and you can see this play out through, I mean, I, I, I love Rothbard's economic histories, and, and one of, of the things that really, I think, elevates his work is his focus on the, this power elite, you know, naming names, identifying what are the intellectual trends, what are the special interest groups, that have, you know, that, that make up almost the, the, the shadows of political power. Um, and some of his works on, uh, I, th I think two of his most underappreciated works are, is a, a Wall Street, Banks and Foreign Policy. And um, uh, and that's another one, uh, Anatomy of uh, the Origins of the Federal Reserve. Both of them kind of take this framework, um, understanding, you know, what, what was the, the, pro the intellectual propaganda campaigns that allowed for, you know, rise of the central bank and things like that. And he highlights, you know, the, the, the way that in order to understand 20th century politics, you really kind of must understand the, the, the battle between, uh, you know, Rockefeller and some of these other, other oligarch groups that have their own sort of intellectual projects, and things like that. And so I think that, you know, this segment of the, of the book, you know, it, it's interesting when you see kind of the, the rise in interest in, in kind of the work of people like Curtis Yarvin and that kind of the concept of the cathedral and the way that, you know, you kind of you know, bringing into kind of a modern audience this this role that it's it's the intellectual side that ends up capturing the state, um, and and explains some of the 
kind of the, the escalating in, in insanity, perhaps, of, of some of the, um, you know, the direction of, of Washington, D.C. as it stands right now. The, the need for this constant machine of propaganda, again, it came up during uh, uh, Tate Fegley's lecture on the deep state about, you know, what really is the purpose of a news outlet? Is it informing the population or is it promoting the regime's narrative? Rothbard here would kind of argue it's, it's promoting the regime's narrative. And th this was true throughout. Like, even if you look at, at the Jacksonian um, politics of old, you, when you kind of start having the rise of democracy, a lot more uh, expansion of the right to vote, the very first thing that political parties recognized was the need to have newspaper outlets as a means to promote their ideology to the masses that can influence the way that they vote. Um, I would argue that there, the ideo ideology of the Jacksonians was a lot better. Um, you, you can go, go look at uh, Rothbard's book on uh, the collection of essays by William Leggett, and you can find you know, a very interesting look at uh, one of the figures within that. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, the, the state itself is going to have an ideology. Where that ideology stems from is going to have an incredible amount of influence on the impact it's going to have on us. And again, I, I think this, this is definitely, I think, one of my favorite parts of this essay to read within the modern lens. Well, and he notes, too, some of the arguments used uh, to keep people from opposing uh, the regime. Uh, he lists some of them. Uh, fear of any alternative. That's a key uh, uh, argument of sorts that uh, they use where just it's the best we can do. Uh, you know, the old uh, democracy is worse than any other system. It, uh, whatever. I don't know. Saying so dumb, I can't remember. Who will build the roads? Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> Who will build the roads? Um, and these, the whole purpose of those statements is embrace the status quo. That's what those those statements mean. And oh, it'll never happen. It'll it'll never be tried. Of course, never is a really long time in politics. So anytime someone says never, I mean, it's just it's irrelevant. Um, and so this idea that uh, any sort of radical change, not only um, would it be bad, but that it's impossible. And uh, Rothbard notes that traditionalism has its role in preserving the state and that, oh, the state's really, really old. It's always been this way. You can't engage in any sort of radical change. And so just forget about it and get back to whatever you were doing before. Uh, another one is nationalism, of course, and this great summary of nationalism here and, and its effect on the state. And of course, that's all related to this idea that our interests are aligned with the interests of the regime, that when the regime defends itself, it's actually defending us, which, of course, is completely untrue. And just all that sort of collectivist thinking that has come out through a bunch of new ideologies in, in recent centuries. And some of the other uh, great uh, strategies here are, of course, censorship, which he discusses in some detail, and uh, which, of course, is particularly uh, relevant right now and how the state, of course, just wants to prevent you from encountering any ideas that might make you dislike the state or the regime. And then specifically the mockery of conspiracy theories, which uh, he noted that uh, people who start pointing out big problems with the regime, oh, they're just, they're, they're just spinning conspiracies. The, the state would never do awful things. And so these, uh, these apparently, it's just fun to see that in 55 years, there hasn't been really much change at all on those issues. And again, if, if we're looking for, for reasons for optimism, if we're looking at, okay, well, you know, why should we have any more hope about better political outcomes than what we had in the past? Um, you know, what, what, what is that, that drive that can kind of, kind of keep these flames going? I think this, you know, reading this passage and recognize that if this is what the state fears, and we are seeing what the state fears surround us. If we are seeing this, all, all of the, the, this, this skepticism of, you know, does the government really represent the best interest of us? Do they really represent us? Or, or are they capable of doing malicious act, uh, actions? You know, I, I, while no matter what the, uh, an individual's overlying ideological whim, you know, whatever political candidate they like or things like that, I think that general sentiment is, is perhaps at a higher part now than it has been in, in a very, very long time. And so if we're looking for a reason why to, to think that there might be a serious challenge to the American regime, I think this chapter is a great, great illustration for why that very well may be around us right now.
Well, the next section, unfortunately, we have to move on. I've got other great quotes here I wanted to read, but there's not time. So uh, the next section is how the state transcends its limits. I think the way I would sum up this section is the state takes uh, institutions and strategies designed to limit the state and turns them into things that actually justify more state action. And uh, I think the biggest probably spends the most time discussing judicial review on this. So. In the Supreme Court, the idea was, oh, the court will then invalidate uh, certain laws and measures that the federal government tries, and that will limit then state power, because we'll just declare those things unconstitutional. Rothbard notes, however, that the inverse often is true as well, in that by declaring things constitutional, the court gives a lot of legitimacy to terrible things that uh, the state attempts to do. Uh, and where we're just meant to believe that, well, if it's constitutional, then it's fine, then it's moral, then let's go ahead with it. And that has become an extremely important uh, function, at least in the US regime, and other regimes try it as well. So the, and of course, the fact that the regime is, it's, is a judge of itself, so there's some disagreement. Uh, can, can we do this thing? Oh, well, we've investigated and found that, yes, it turns out we can do this thing, and it's fine, and we've done no wrong. And that is essentially how the Supreme Court functions. And I mean, you can see that in some of the lamer uh, judgments that have come out of the Supreme Court, such as their, their ruling that uh, concentration camps for Japanese Americans are fine. I mean, this, there's a perfect example right there. Uh, why did they come to that ruling? No honest reading of American law could uh, lead you to that conclusion. But, you know, they received pressure from the White House. And so they made that ruling. Uh, there's, it's not an independent part of the regime, and that's been extremely effective in perpetuating a, for, uh, a U.S. federal power there. And then he talks a little bit about John C. Calhoun's idea of the concurrent majority, which he thinks in the abstract is fine in that, yeah, of course, it's good to have this idea that you should be able to veto federal powers at the state level. But then he says... Uh, Calhoun doesn't go nearly far enough because in Calhoun's thinking, only the state level can do this. Only a government organization has this ability to veto anything he's saying. It doesn't go down to the county level or to the municipal level or let alone to a individual level. So he notes that if you're just going to say then that uh, a state, a bunch of politicians have the ability to nullify a law, which he notes, by the way, implies the ability to secede, if that, that right is reserved only to certain politicians, then it just doesn't really, it's not very radical at all, and it just doesn't really amount to all that much. So uh, you can see some of his later secessionist radicalism uh, really become obvious here as well, and that just ends up then uh, supporting state-level despotism as well, since there's no alternative to that, no lower level of nullification on that. So it's uh, there, <laughs> all of these institutions that were created uh, in order to limit the power of the state have, uh, have failed and that the state has been very adept at using purported limitations on its power to actually expand its power. I think the Supreme Court stuff is, is still, I mean, even, even you know, this, this was written in 65, um, you know, in particular, it deals with the way that the New Deal got, you know, after two years of complaints and concerns by the Supreme Court as an institution that, that you know, there was uh, not constitutional legitimacy for aspects in the New Deal. They, they get threatened by the possibility for, for packing the court, expanding the court. So they end up, you know, there, there's political calculations here. There's self-serving interests by the, of the Supreme Court. To get over even you know, th th those purely constitutional concerns within it that end up creating you know, a, a revolution within the, the state, right? You know, the, 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 the reality of New Deal policies in the U.S. was essentially a, a revolution within the form. Um, uh, Garrett Garrett has some, some great work on this. This continues again in, you know, during the civil rights regime and some of the major changes within the, the structure of the government in the late 1960s. We can see the, the, the war on terror regime and the like. The, the, the focus of the Supreme Court as an institution is to confirm and justify these radical expansions of government power. Um, and so, again, it's, it's you know, a, a, a lot to unpack within this. Uh, the next section is what the state fears. And this is a fun section in the age of January 6th. Uh, <laughs> he notes that... Uh, 
crimes against the state are punished with more gusto than crimes against regularly regular people. So uh, he notes, right, just uh, look at how uh, beating up a cop is treated versus beating up a private citizen. A huge difference in how the state responds to that. And just the sheer level of effort that is given to tracking down and punishing anyone that is uh, deemed guilty of any sort of treason, uh, you know, that, which doesn't really exist, but they certainly, the, the, the regime certainly thinks it does. Uh, seditious conspiracy, another made up crime, when in reality, of course, if you uh, shoot somebody, whether he's an agent of the state or not, that's, that's what you should be prosecuted for, is some, the, some specific act of violence. But the state likes to impose this extra imaginary stuff on top. We're shooting people, the problem isn't that you shot the person, the problem is you shot an agent of the state. And so they add a lot of that then just to make sure and entrap people who uh, are considered dangerous to the regime. And just look at the amount of energy that the FBI has committed to tracking down and punishing January 6 people and the absolute lack of effort they put toward tracking down, um, say, people who sexually assault their victims, like in the case of uh, Larry Nasser, and in a variety of, and any anytime that it's one of their friends who commits some sort of crime. I mean, look at the lack of enthusiasm in prosecuting Hunter Biden. I mean, it's just really quite amazing the double standard that exists. So what really matters when they really care about you is when you are uh, are deemed some sort of threat to the regime. And the state fears then that, of course, they, they, they want to keep crime low enough that the regime seems generally legitimate, because if, if there's complete chaos in the streets, that's bad for the regime. Uh, but they don't particularly care about that, especially since the most successful rulers in the regime live in gated communities. And, you know, if you live in a regular community and you're getting burgled on a daily basis, well, too bad. Uh, and on top of that, then, is uh, really the two things. So systematically, the two things the state fears is either revolution or conquest by a foreign state. And so obviously they're going to punish anyone that they think is a potential revolutionary at the domestic level. And that's why they also spend so much time trying to dominate, weaken, and generally meddle in other states too, which is to secure their own power. And the more powerful the state generally, the more res your resources they're going to expend on uh, meddling in other states and conquering them, bombing them, especially uh, smaller states that can't fight back. And so it, it's good to think of the, the regime in those terms uh, and to keep in mind what it is they fear and what they're most likely to really freak out about. Because there's lots of stuff that's illegal that the state just doesn't notice much, but there are certain things that you can be sure will bring retribution from state agents. Of course, when you combine this with the crony economic spheres of power when you, the, the the use of big tech and the like um as as mediary as as, as moderators of the proper discourse out there we're gonna i think we're only gonna see more and more of this censorship even with you know, you know elon musk and and you know twitter now x or whatever it is i think in the long run because this is what the state fears and because of how much overlap there is with political pressure you know, how, how much Elon Musk depends upon federal funds. And to the extent that they really start taking Twitter as a serious threat, they're going to have to respond to this because of the degree to which it is the control of that information. It's the control of the perception. I, I, think, I think you're also going to see in, in 2024, I'm, I'm interested to see with the, the buildup of concerns about election integrity. I mean, I, I think questioning the election is going to end up even, you know, we already saw that kind of in the aftermath of 2020. I understand that, but I think that is one of the biggest threats going on right now. Because if you have a large enough percentage of the population that doesn't simply, they're not simply politically apathetic, but they're explicitly uh, uh, skeptical of the quality of the elections, and then that is one of the biggest, you know, chinks within the the regime's armor. They need to have the sort of recognition that even if I am in the losing political party. That least I had an honest say with them. That. that is what allows them to, to justify their perception of legitimacy. And so now that we see that as the big breakaway, I mean, and you're, they're going to do everything they can to take down these candidates that are going to raise these points, right? So they're going to you know, you know, they continue to do, they continue to find new cases against Trump. They continue to censor Robert Kennedy Jr., right? You know, they're going to keep going after these sort of, of anti-legitimacy candidates. 
Um, and you know, I, I think the extent to which they are, are going to treat, are, they're preparing to deal with political realities in 2024, where we're only seeing, I think, the tip of the iceberg, because again, this is what the state fears most. Well, the next section is how states relate to one another. And uh, this is a, I think, he doesn't really get explicit here in the section with the terminology, but I think he provides a good seed of a nice realist view of foreign policy. And that, uh, if you've ever listened to the War Economy and State podcast, you'll know that Zachary Yost and I are both realists in terms of that's the, uh, the framework we have adopted uh, for our foreign policy, because I think that's the most compatible uh, with Rothbardian and uh, with anti-war uh, foreign policy ideals. Um, although he's, he's, a, uh, he's an a, a offensive realist, whereas I'm a defensive realist, which I think is more libertarian. But uh, So tune in to listen to us uh, take digs at each other over that one issue. But I think you can see then that on the realist issue, it's that works well with Rothbard's explanation here in the sense that he talks about how the functioning assumption of a regime in terms of how it relates to another state is this realist notion that when, of course, it's a, it's a fiction, really, is that the state uh, represents the country and that states like to act like they own the whole country. So when states engage in treaties and they say sign over a portion of their territory to another country, they act like they owned that and that they they have the authority to just uh, parcel that out to to other uh, politicians and to really just uh, redraw the lines and to really decide for those people in that area where they live now and what uh, law they're subject to. And so the idea is that states are these um, these unitary organizations that uh, can decide for everybody within that territory what the new reality is. Now, of course, that's not the actual reality, but that is the functioning assumption that states uh, employ. And I think Rothbard has some good insights here as to how that works. And the other, I think, major part of that section is that he notes that... Um, the best parts that have uh, are that have come out of international law and in efforts to uh, restrain states in terms of foreign policy um, are that are the those aspects of international law that recognize that people are not actually part of the regime. So while states prefer to employ this this realist ideal that uh, everything's the same inside the state. And that, you know, Americans versus Russians or whatever, that we're all in agreement on this and we all support our own states and stuff. And he notes, however, that the people of the United States and the people of Russia uh, are not, of course, the regime. And that any decent foreign policy notes that this is not true. And, and you can see this also a bit in Benedict Anderson's book on nationalism, where he notes how nationalism convinced people that whatever country their regime was at war with was someplace they shouldn't visit and they shouldn't talk to those people and that those people were somehow off limits to them. Now, this would have been a crazy idea to most people in, say, the 17th or 18th century. The idea that, uh, well, my, my government's at war with this foreign government, so I better not go to that country because uh, we all have to hate each other, the people who live in these two countries. It was recognized that the regime has its own thing going on and it's going to fight people and they're doing that sort of stuff, but it really isn't relevant uh, to your daily life. Uh, but that was, by the 20th century, abandoned in favor of this extremely moralistic view that uh, people in foreign countries are somehow supporting their regime and are responsible for the war. And we started to see it in this current war where I saw all these journalists trying to create theories where uh, unless a Russian was engaged in outright revolt against Moscow, that this person was eligible to be bombed by the United States because they weren't resisting their regime enough. So you can just kill any Russian you want. 
because Russians are all responsible. And that's that's a favorite tactic of the of regimes, by the way, is we are all responsible for whatever horrible thing the government does. We are all murderers. We are all racists. This is uh, this is something that collectivists like to do when the reality is, of course, that we may not support the regime at all and don't and don't think like it. But that's but in foreign policy, states labor under uh, this assumption, and they're pretty successful at getting people to agree with that once war actually begins. We can, we can look at the consequences of this sort of you know the states can negotiate amongst themselves different border lines, but you know the role that Crimea has played within the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, you know, a, a, a border drawn on politically motivated lens without any sort of consideration for the underlying population. We have a larger conversation with the Tartars and, and you know, that whole <laughs> pre-existing history there, um, you know, but, but the, the extent to which a Russian identity was kind of ignored within the drawing of political lines kind of created this, this ulcer that, you know, has, has played a, a, a major role in terms of a, a very active war zone in the world right now. And so, you know, I, I think there's, we, we, see, we can see the consequences of this. Well, and for such a large, diverse country, that is clearly a, uh, a multinational, multi-ethnic country as Russia or the United States. It's just kind of silly, of course, to claim that everyone's in agreement in those situations. But that's the goal of the nationalists and the, uh, the regime unity types is to get everybody thinking in those terms, especially about the other guy. So then you can kill as many of them as you want because they're all uniform and, and against you. Uh, and they think like the state thinks, which th this, this, the fact that there is this great division between uh, the regime and the people that live under it is the, is the theme of the final section here, which is history is a race between state power and social power. And I think this really gets to the heart of what liberalism is, radical liberalism, laissez-faire liberalism, classical liberalism, libertarianism, whatever you want to call it. It's all from the same uh, tradition, which is that state and society are two very different things. And this is how the liberals in the 18th and 19th century phrased it, is that there's the state, or there's the regime, and then there is society, there's the social power. And the social power is people engaging in trade, in commerce, in uh, religious activities, in going to the tavern and uh, building bonds with their fellow human being, whereas the state power is about uh, extraction, uh, it's about imposing force, it's about engaging in war. Uh, that's a totally different thing. And the liberals recognized that the two are not the same and that one exploits the other. And at the, at, at the root of any claim to really want to support human rights and to note that people have, have rights beyond the purview of the state, you, you have to really embrace this idea that anyone who rejects this idea that there's a fundamental difference between state power and social power, um, they're probably not compatible with any sort of free market liberal or libertarian uh, view. You might encounter people who um, say they want freedom and so on, but if they're unwilling to make this distinction between the social power and the state power, as the liberals did and created very compelling arguments around for 200 years, uh, you're, you're probably not going to come to a good conclusion uh, going over to that sort of thinking. So the last section, I think, is extremely important in terms of tying together the views uh, Rothbard has in this essay with the larger liberal movement and the larger recognition that uh, these two sorts of ways of thinking and ways of living and sources of power in society are very different and should never be combined and that they're not natural friends with each other either. Uh, and that again, as he notes in the first two sections, that this is a predatory relationship um, between uh, the state and the people. And, and just one final note he makes on here is he describes social power as the power over nature. It's, it's homesteading, contract, capital creation, uh, good stewardship of the world. So social power is what we do uh, voluntarily with each other and building things and just using the world around us uh, to create good things. 
whereas he notes that state power is power over other people and the ability to force people to do things and destroy them if desired. So he provides that very interesting insight as well in, uh, in how to think about the difference between the two types of power. And this dynamic of, of this, this sort of liberal class analysis that you can find within the works of not just Rothbard, but Ralph Rako, uh, Dr. Hoppe touches upon that. I, I think this is a very interesting dynamic. It's something that, that distinguishes Austrian scholars from a lot of others. I, there was a recent article uh, where uh, an article, a writer for National Review was criticizing Paul Gottfried uh, because he had a, an appreciation for, for class theory. Um, and, and, and the likes, oh, this sounds very Marxist, you know, right, right, these, these right-wing Marxists, Paul Gottfried, and it's just, it's absurd commentary. <laughs> but, but, you know, particularly for an audience like this, where, you know, I know we don't just have economic students here, but we have people throughout a variety of different disciplines. You know, I always thought there's be something interesting about sort of a, a Rothbardian literature analysis, right? Kind of, kind of think, taking this sort of critical, you know, you know, you know lens and, and applying it beyond simply history narrowly, but this conflict between the state and society. Um, you know, I, I think this is ultimately this kind of, I think kind of goes to the heart of kind of, kind of what, what motivates us, right? You know, we, we, we want to be enemies of the state kind of in that Rothbardian heroic tradition. Uh, but I think applying this to fields outside of simply, you know, politics, history, economics, purely, um, of course, if, if, if you want some, some Rothbardian analysis of, uh, fiction and literature, I highly recommend looking at Irrepressible Rothbard with some of his uh, infamous movie reviews and, and other uh, co cultural commentary that he was a, 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 a big fan of. But um, yeah, this is, uh, there's, there's a lot here, I think, that, that we can continue to build within the tradition. All right. Well, that's it for this episode of Radio Rothbard. We are out of time, and so we'll be back next week with our normal format uh, for another episode. So we'll see you next time. <laughs>